Howdy folks and welcome to another episode of Workshop Wednesday and thank you to the incredibly talented Sammy Hallam for the intro artwork. Outstanding as always, Sammy. This week I'm going to be trying something, well, a bit different to what I've done previously, rather than Warhammer 40,000. I'm going to be painting up this, the infamous turd on tracks, the M3 Lee. Uh, this is a model, and I don't know what manufacturer it comes from, that Rita built well over a year ago. It's been just sitting around, generally unloved, unpainted, collecting dust. There are bits missing. Uh, the top machine gun turret or hatch, whichever it's supposed to have, we have no idea where that is. So why are you painting this shitty thing, Jingles? Well, I've never painted a tank before, and I didn't really want to start on something that I actually care about. So the M3 Lee it is. So I'm going to start by priming it in two different base colours. It's going to get an all over coat of Chaos Black and then I'm going to do this fancy new technique I've heard about, they call, I think, Zenithal Highlighting, uh, where I'll be spraying the grey sear on just from the top. And I'm doing this for two reasons. First, it's going to lighten the areas where most of the light would be striking the tank in the first place from above. And secondly, it really does help to bring those details out so you can see exactly what it is that you should be focusing on. So the first base coat that I'm applying is Olive Drab. It's actually Citadel Miniatures Castellan Green, which is basically Olive Drab. And the reason I'm doing it the hard way with a brush, well actually there are two reasons why I'm doing it the hard way. I don't own an airbrush because those things are expensive and I've just gotten into the hobby. Um, and also, I don't have a spray can of the relevant base colour. So, yeah, I'm going to be doing this the hard way. I'm definitely going to be painting more tanks and ships and aircraft and stuff like that, so investing in a spray can of this olive drab is definitely going to be a very, very good idea. But for now, this is what I've got, so this is how I'm doing it. One thing that I've definitely learned from this whole process is I'm way better at painting tanks than I am at painting miniature figures. Um, almost certainly because of the fine detail and brush control that's required when you're painting a miniature character. That doesn't really apply so much when you're painting something like this. You've got all these big flat areas that are exactly the same colour, at least when you're applying the base. Obviously that's going to change when I come to add the highlighting, the details and the weathering. But even when you're adding the highlighting, the details and the weathering, it doesn't really matter that much if your hand isn't steady or your eyes aren't good enough. Um, because, well, in the case of the weathering, a lot of it's going to overlap areas anyway in order to achieve that natural look. But more on that when we actually come to applying the weathering. For now, I'm getting this base coat down. And hopefully you can see that the areas on top of the tank um, that have more of that light grey undercoat are coming out in a slightly lighter shade of olive drab compared to the sides of the tank for example and it's a very very subtle effect and it's not necessarily something that you will notice but it's one of those things that you might not notice it but your brain does and hopefully if I've done it right it should help sell the idea to your brain that what you're looking at is something real and not just a painted miniature even though you know it's just a painted miniature I'm also not really going to bother painting the underside because you're not going to see it uh, about halfway through this base painting process I decided you know what not only have I never painted a tank before but I've also never built or painted a diorama and I decided well as long as I'm experimenting and learning new things, why not start with this? Of course, I then realised that if I'm making a diorama out of the M3 Lee, I should probably have painted it in a desert colour scheme, because the Lee saw most of its active service in North Africa. It, it wasn't a very good tank, but even when they were building it, they knew it wasn't a very good tank, but it's what they could build um, while they were finalising the design of the M4 Sherman and it was mostly used by the British in North Africa. And it was very well liked by the British. I mean, it did have an extremely effective 75mm gun with an extremely effective 75mm high explosive shell. 
even if it was mounted in that incredibly awkward side sponson, it was arguably the most effective gun on any British tank up to that point. It was certainly the most versatile, largely due to the fact that it had a useful high explosive shell. Don't forget, most British tanks at this point in the war were on with either two pounder or, if you were lucky, six pounder anti-tank guns. And they didn't have effective high explosive shells. And it was incredibly useful for tanks to have effective high explosive shells. If you're firing at a bunch of dug-in troops or a machine gun nest or a bunker or some kind of fortification or just troops in some kind of hard cover, an armour piercing shell is just going to put a very very small hole in that piece of hard cover. If you're lucky there might be some shrapnel and fragmentation, but honestly you'd be better off throwing a hand grenade. Not so with a 75mm high explosive shell, which was exactly the tool required for that kind of job. And British tanks didn't really have those until the introduction of the M3 Lee. It was always only ever intended to be a stopgap tank. It was like, you know, yeah, the Sherman's not quite ready, it's coming, in the meantime, have these. Almost like, here's a tank you can practice on, get good at it and we'll give you a real tank later. But it was appreciated by the British troops in North Africa, even though it was mostly obsolete, even as it was rolling off the production line, it did still have a very effective gun. The Germans certainly respected it, although the Russians hated it. Large quantities of these things were sent to Russia via the Lend-Lease program, and the Russian Lees had a crew of seven, and the Russians referred to them as a coffin for seven brothers. But anyway, yeah, I, in retrospect, probably should have painted this thing in some kind of desert colour scheme, but once again, I'm painting with the paints that I had at the time. I was planning on mounting this thing in a sort of northwestern Europe diorama, um, and I should have known better, of course, but the Lees never saw service in northwestern Europe, as many of you happily pointed out in this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles, although they did see service in Sicily, so that could work. At one point I was thinking of painting this thing up as a Russian M3 Lee, because, as mentioned, the Russians did use it, even if they didn't like it. But again, I don't quite have the right colours for the Russian tank paint pattern, so... American M3 Lee in Sicily, I think, is the way we're going to go. Right now I'm getting some paint on the suspension and the lower side hull, and yes, I'm kind of just slapping it on without any real care or attention, and that's completely deliberate, because two reasons. This is the area of the tank where most of the damage to the paintwork would be, in reality. And also, there's going to be so much weathering and oil and grease and just shit smeared over all of these running parts of the tank that you are really not going to notice the difference. Right, that's pretty much the undercoat done. Just a couple of little spots here and there that need touching up. We're going to let that dry. And then we're going to move on to the fun part. And when I say the fun part, I mean, depending on your perspective, either mind-blowingly tedious <laughs> or incredibly zen and relaxing. Now, again, I've never done this before, and I've got a choice of two colour shades that I'm going to use for this. The first is Coelia Green Shade, uh, which I did use on all of the Olive Drab camo on my Imperial Guardsmen with good results. And the second is Known Oil Gloss. Now, I've heard this stuff referred to as skill in a bottle, and as soon as I started using it, I could see why. But at this point, I haven't even opened the bottle, and I really don't know which colour is going to work best. So I'm going to try them out, and I'm going to try them out in a part of the tank that isn't going to get seen. So if it ends up ruining the olive drab undercoat, it doesn't really make any difference. So first thing that we're going to try is the Coelia green shade. Get some onto my palette there. And then we're just going to slap it over one of these bottom plates. See how it looks. So the idea is, because this is a slightly... Well, it's a different shade of green to the olive drab. It's a little brighter, it's a little richer, but it's also very dark. So hopefully, like applying a wash, because that's basically what these shade paints are, it's going to collect in the recesses and around the edges and help add definition to them. And it, it's alright. It's 
I'm not sure I like the way it's changed, although it is dark at the moment because it's wet and it's going to lighten as it dries out, but I'm not sure I particularly like the way it's changed uh, the colour of the olive drab underneath it. I mean, that's what it's for, but I'm not sure I like the effect. So we're going to have a go on the other plate, this time with the Nuln Oil. And I'm doing the same thing to the second plate, side by side with the Colia Green Shade, just so I can... Yeah, you know, I think I... I think I prefer the Nuln Oil. It's darkening the olive drab, but it's not changing the colour. And it's applying the same effect around the edges that I need darkening, so... Yeah. I can see why they call this stuff skill in a bottle. So I've decided on using the Nuln Oil, because I just think it produces a better look. And now comes the incredibly laborious process of adding this shade of paint in a sort of spot wash to every rivet, nut, bolt, and edge on the entire tank. Right, that's the tedious, well I say tedious part, I actually found it quite relaxing. It was a completely stress-free, brain-free way of spending nearly an hour. Anyway, while that's drying it's time to do the detail work. All of the bits that aren't olive drab, the pickaxe heads, the crank handle, the tow cables, the handles for the axe and the shovel, things like that. This part really doesn't take very long, and you don't need too steady a hand for it, even though you are picking out fine detail. These are fine details that are raised quite prominently above the surface of the tank, so it's difficult, even if you're as cack-handed as I am, it's actually quite difficult to screw it up. I painted all of the bits that are going to be bare metal in lead belcher for that good old metallic look, and then slapped a dash of Nuln oil all over the top of those as well. And so, here's what it looks like. And I think at this point, I'm about halfway done. I realise the Null Oil is, well, because it's the gloss version, it is very shiny, but the whole thing's going to get covered in a coat of matte varnish, and there's additional layers that are going to go over the top anyway, so at this point, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> 
Next up I applied some decals. I'm pretty sure they're not exactly the correct scale, but they're what I had, so they're what I used. And the decals are very, very shiny. But that's alright, because I've got one of these paints from uh, Citadel's Technical brand. It's called Technical Storm Shield. And this is exactly what it's for. You see, paint consists of two things, pigment and medium. The pigment is where the actual colour comes from, and the pigment is suspended in a medium, and the medium is probably 95% of the actual paint, but it has no colour, it's completely transparent. And so what I'm doing here is applying this coat of what's essentially paint medium over the top of the decals. And it's basically acting like a matte varnish, and it doesn't matter if you run over the sides of the decals and you get it on the uh, base coat, because it's transparent, and I'm going to be applying a coat of matte varnish over the entire model at the end anyway. So this is a really useful way of getting rid of that unwanted shininess on any decals that you've applied to your model. It also helps seal them in, because they're now under a coat of what is effectively paint. And now for the fun part, weathering. And I really do mean fun, although maybe I just need to get out more and talk to some girls. <laughs> so, this is another one of Citadel's technical paints. It's called a Grillen Earth. It mostly tends to get used for doing the bases of your miniatures, because once it dries out, it, it well, basically looks like mud that's dried out and cracked. But it's great for applying weathering to areas of a tank that tend to attract an awful lot of mud, like the tracks and the suspension. And that's what we're going to be using here. Now, I don't recommend you use a good brush for this. Luckily, I've got a whole bunch of paint brushes that Rita used ages ago and didn't look after. <laughs> and she's basically ruined them, um, because she didn't know any better. And I'm going to be using one of those to apply this to the suspension. Now, I know that it looks like I'm just slapping this shit on everywhere, but there is a method to the madness, because before you start applying this stuff, you have to take into consideration where, on a tank, would it A, get muddy in the first place, and B, where would that mud have an opportunity to actually dry out? So, yeah, I am putting some of this on the road wheels, but the majority is going onto the bogies where they would get covered in mud, but they're not, strictly speaking, moving parts. So the mud would have an opportunity to dry out, but also you have to bear in mind that if the mud gets on there in the first place, when it gets on there it isn't dry, so fresh mud is going to find its way onto these parts of the tank. And for that, we're going to be using another uh, Citadel Technical Paint. This is Sterland Battlemire, and this is really thick nasty fresh mud. But first I have to wait for this stuff to dry out. And while we're waiting for that to happen, I'm going to get to work on the tracks. Now, when you're doing the tracks, again, you have to apply the same kind of thought process. At first you're going to think the tracks are going to be the muddiest part of the whole vehicle, and to an extent you're right, because they're the part of the tank that's most in contact with the ground. So they're the part of the tank that's going to be collecting most of the mud. But the tracks are in constant motion. So it's only really mostly going to be the mud that collects in the recesses of the tracks, between the track pads, that's going to have an opportunity to stick there. The rest of the mud, particularly on the inside of the track, is going to get rubbed off in contact with the road wheels. It's still going to be muddy, but it's not going to be absolutely caked in grime. What is going to be caked in grime are the grouses. So these are the, the cleats on the outside edges. Because they don't actually physically come into contact with anything other than mud. Now, they're under constant vibration, so a lot of that mud is going to get shook off. And these are the sort of things that you really should be taking into account when you're planning on where to actually put all the weathering. I've got to be honest with you. Weathering the tracks was easily the most tedious part of this entire project. But it could have been a lot worse. At least the, uh, the tracks on this kit come in two completely separate, pre-moulded pieces of rubber. Uh, I've seen other tank kits where the tracks have to be assembled quite literally, pad by pad, link by link, 
and pin by pin. So, yeah, this could have been a lot worse. Once I'm done here with this initial layer of dried earth, I'm going to wipe off most of it, just leaving enough to apply a bit of stain and a bit of texture, but most of it is going to get wiped off, particularly along the inside of the tracks in the centre of the pads, because this is where the road wheels are going to be in contact and are probably going to do a reasonably good job of rubbing most of that mud off before it even gets a chance to dry. OK, we're going to leave the tracks to dry out, shouldn't take too long. And while that's happening, we're going to take another look at our suspension, now that that's had a chance to dry out. And I'm going to be adding some of this shade paint. It's called Reichland Flesh Shade. Basically, it's a kind of dark brown wash. And you can see how the tracks, or the suspension roller, has dried out nicely, and it looks just like dried mud. But it's a little bit too dry, too clean. And because it's all exactly the same uniform colour, you can't really see any of the details. So that's why we're applying this Reichland Flesh Shade. And it acts a lot like a wash. It flows into all of the nooks and crannies and really brings the details out. As well as adding a bit of tone to the underlying colour. Because a shade paint is translucent, you can see through it. You can still see the colour of the dried mud underneath. And it looks wet now, but that's just because the paint is wet. Once that dries out, that's going to add some really nice definition without obliterating all of the work that we did putting that mud on there in the first place. I'm going to do exactly the same thing to the exhaust because this is also one of those places on the tank where you would expect it to both accumulate a lot of mud and because it's hot back there, you'd expect that mud to dry out quickly. The exhaust is also a part of the tank that you probably expect to see some rust effects because it gets hot back there and it would bake and crack and flake the paint off, which then gets wet and covered in mud and starts to rust. Uh, on this M3, however, I mean, I could go to that kind of detail, but you're probably not really actually going to see the exhaust, and it's going to be covered in mud anyway, so this will do. I was painting a different tank, of course, a Russian tank or a German tank, where the exhaust is located on the top of the engine deck or to the sides of the engine deck, then yeah, absolutely, I, I would be putting that level of detail in, but I'm not. I'm painting an M3 Lee, and you're mostly never going to see it anyway. Next, same deal, this time on the tracks. Paying particular attention, of course, to the inside of the tracks, because they're still going to be muddy and dusty, but the majority of that mud is going to be rubbed off because it's going to be in almost constant contact with the road wheels. So that's taking care of all of our dried mud effects, but what about all of the wet mud effects? What about all the mud that's going to get stuck to the sides of the hull, that's going to get wedged up inside the suspension, and it's going to stay wet because every time the tracks go around they're scooping up fresh mud and plastering it all over those big flat surfaces. That's what we're going to use this Sterland Battlemire for. This is the technical paint that I talked about earlier. And this really is nasty stuff. Do not apply any of this with a paintbrush unless you never want to be able to use that paintbrush for anything else ever again. Instead, you want to use something like this. This is a texture tool. It's got a thick end and a thin end. You can probably figure out what each end is for. So... Using the texture tool, we're really going to wedge some of this stuff. I mean, look at it. That's just nasty. And it is clever stuff. I mean, it's not really quite as thick as it looks. Well, I suppose it is, but it's, it's still remarkably fluid. You can get a good scoop of it like that with the texture tool. But it's, it's not quite as pasty as it looks. It doesn't just stick to the tool and is impossible to get off. It's actually quite easy to spread around and work it into all of the nooks and crannies that you want it to. So I'm applying generous portions of this stuff, bearing in mind that it's going to run down the side of the tank hull, so more at the bottom than at the top. But at the same time, it wouldn't be unusual for clumps of it to just stick solidly to the upper parts of the side of the hull and, and start to dry out. So I don't think you can really put too much of this stuff on. I could have probably gotten away with putting twice as much Sterling and Battlemire in all the various different bits on the uh, lower half of this tank, and it wouldn't have looked out of place. And this was the fun 
the really fun part. Just slapping this shit on all over. And really going to work muddying up the lower half of this tank. The next thing I'm going to do, and this is going to help bring out the edge highlights as well as deal with some of the shininess around the spot washes and particularly around the rivets that I was doing with the Nuln oil earlier, is I'm going to do a process that's known as dry brushing. Now this is one of the very uh, very first painting techniques that I learned and it's not really recommended so much if you're doing fine detail work on a small character figure for example uh, unless you're planning on going over it with glazes and other layers but for large flat surfaces like those that you find on a tank it's a very fast and surprisingly effective way of getting lighter shades of your base colors to stick to the highlights and the raised areas of the object that you're painting. Now if you're made of money you can buy a brush that's dedicated for dry brushing but there's absolutely no reason to go to that kind of expense. If you have an old brush lying around, a brush like for example this one that's really no good for much of anything so I'm just going to use this as a dry brush because the process of dry brushing ruins brushes. So you don't want to be using a good brush for it. This brush on the other hand isn't really any good for anything else so it's perfect for use as a dry brush. So how does one dry brush a model? Well, first you get some paint on your brush and then using a tissue or a cloth you wipe most of that paint off and I really do mean most of it. You keep swiping away until there's very very little paint left on the brush until in fact the brush is dry. Yeah that's why they call it dry brushing. They're not very imaginative these artistic types are they? <laughs> anyway, you now take your dry brush and you just flick it backwards and forwards across all of the raised surfaces that you want to dry brush. Now because there's hardly any actual paint on the brush it's only really going to deposit paint on those areas of the model that create the most friction and resistance as the brush passes over the top of it. So all of those bits that stick up, like the heads of all of those rivets, the various different pieces that stick up from the surface of the tank. You'll know straight away if you've got too much paint on your dry brush when you start leaving streaks over flat surfaces. But one thing that the act of dry brushing will definitely not do is deposit any paint in all of the recessed areas of the tank. So all of those parts that you washed with a shade paint earlier to darken up all the cracks and crevices and nooks and crannies, they're, they're going to stay dark. The dry brushing isn't going to affect any of that. So that's going to give you a, a very distinctive contrast between all of the recessed areas of the tank that are going to stay in the darker shades that you applied and all of the highlighted areas of the tank uh, that are going to have a lighter shade of the colour that you've painted the tank. Or at least that's how it works in theory. This really is very simple to do. Seriously, anybody can do this. The only way you can really screw this up is if you leave too much paint on the brush. Other than that, it is a very, very simple technique. I mean, I'm doing it, how hard can it be? Once the dry brush is complete, and this doesn't take very long at all, the only thing left to do is to get some coats of matte varnish applied all over. And this will not only help to seal in all of those mud effects that we applied, but it should also take any residual shine that didn't get sorted out by the dry brushing, particularly in those areas that we covered with that glossy Nuln Oil shade paint earlier. And that, at least as far as the tank itself is concerned, is pretty much it. I mean, there is more that I could be doing. I could be applying stippling and chipping effects to show areas of the tank where the paint has been chipped through, exposing the bare metal or perhaps the primer underneath, uh, rust effects and things like that. But, well, those are all things that I've never really done before. And I've already managed to get away with a whole bunch of things that I've never really done before on this tank already. And I don't really want to push my luck. <laughs> I want to quit while I'm ahead. And those are the sort of things that I'm going to be saving for another day. And I'm still probably less than halfway through. 
this project because I've done the tank, now I need to do the crew, and then I need to do the landscape that they're all going to be based on. And that's a whole bunch of other things that I either have very little or no experience of, but that's what's going to be coming up in the next videos. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed watching this half as much as I enjoyed actually doing it, except for the tracks, they were a ball ache. <laughs> and uh, as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.